Timestamps and relevant links will be in the description below. Welcome everybody, I hope you're all doing well today. There's gonna be a bit of a background noise outside, so I apologize if it gets picked up on the mic. Last month, I talked about why musical licensing is such a nightmare to navigate when talking about the Undertale Yellow situation. In short, you have two types of copyright, which then leads to six different types of licenses, which all affect who gets paid as a result. Tack on a bunch of other nuance, and then you have music copyright in a nutshell. And now it's relevant in this episode. Because not only has an expired music license agreement recently led to an ongoing dispute between TikTok and Universal Media Group, causing UMG to remove all their music from the platform, but music licensing also caused an entire game to be removed from digital storefronts. Spec Ops The Line was released back in 2012, however now in 2024 it's being pulled from digital storefronts, and it's been confirmed that the reason is music licensing. The licenses for various tracks have now expired, and rather than renewing the licenses or removing the offending tracks from the game, it's just being pulled altogether. The reason why games tend to not have permanent licenses is because money. It just costs too much to do it that way, especially for a game that might not be relevant decades down the line. As for why they don't just remove the offending tracks like they do with Grand Theft Auto, I can't answer that one. That's more of a game dev question. I have no clue how difficult that solution actually is. But fortunately, looking at my Steam library, I can still re-download the game, you just can't purchase it for the very first time anymore. And in this era where you generally own nothing but a revocable admission ticket, I am glad to see that my admission ticket has not actually been revoked. And music licensing is also potentially relevant to Mother 3, the sequel to Earthbound, which was just recently released on the Nintendo Switch, but only in Japan. Come on, Reggie, give us Mother 3! So what's the deal with Mother 3 never being localized? There haven't been too many official responses, but one of the common speculations is music licensing. There are a lot of tracks in the game that are inspired by or pay tribute to existing songs. A lot of it classical music, but plenty of contemporary tracks as well. Such as paying homage to the Batman theme and 20th Century Fox theme, and the track Natural Killer Cyborg has a similar guitar riff to Beat It by Michael Jackson. And given that I just made a video about Power World and differences between Japanese and US copyright law, it feels like it would make sense, the idea of the codified statutes of Japanese law saying you can make this kind of music, while in the US it becomes more ambiguous, because when do you need a clear sample? It depends. When is a song so similar that you can successfully sue someone? It depends. But there's definitely more to it than that, because this is an issue more prevalent than you would think. Uh, there are some shows that will have completely different soundtracks depending on where or even how you watch it. Which leads to the other common fan theory that this game wouldn't be able to be released given today's climate because of characters such as Reggie, Facade, and the entire Magipsy tribe. And then if you censor it, you have an entirely different group of complaining about censorship. But Nintendo has outright denied the offensive content theory. The game was released at the end of a console cycle, and now it's an 18-year-old sequel to a game that originally sold horribly in the US, even though that's definitely their fault. But if Nintendo thought there was money at the idea of localizing or remastering Mother 3, they would have made it work, even if that means changing a few tracks and going the Konami route of saying we're keeping the artist's original vision. But the saving grace here is that a fan translation patch exists in the first place, and the lead is a professional translator. The patch is what I would call tacitly permitted because Nintendo knows about its existence because it's been offered to them. And given that you can copyright a script in the same way that you can copyright song lyrics combined with the trademark associations with the fan translation, if the rights holders wanted to take down the fan translation patch, they definitely could. Meanwhile, Atoy himself seems to be perfectly okay with the idea of mother-related fan projects because he even liked a tweet from Earthbound Dimensions, a fan project remaking the game in Godot. So how can you actually play Mother 3 outside of Japan? You could create a Japanese eShop account and then play with a separate translated story guide. Or if you have a working Game Boy Advance or Nintendo DS, you can buy a fan reproduction cart, just make sure it has the version 1.3 patch. For everything else, it's up to you to make sure you're in compliance with your own country's laws. But using cartridge dumping tools, you could back up your own copy of Mother 3 and then patch it yourself. You can play it on a modded Switch using the Cave Database Manager. Or if you have a modded 3DS or Wii U, you can use Virtual Console Injection. Uh, the problem with playing this game on an emulator is that the combat system is rhythm-based. So even though MGBA is a great emulator overall, maintaining 100% speed is difficult for any emulator, so you can have occasional input delay. But it's still perfectly playable overall. Though there might be one final emulator solution with the recently updated SkyEMU, which is the first Game Boy Advance emulator to pass 100% of the timing suite tests. So on paper, it should work well on there, but I haven't tested it myself, so I can't guarantee anything. And while on the topic of fan translation patches, we've had quite a few other new ones come up recently. 
If you've enjoyed the Custom Robo series, then you're in luck because Custom Robo GX for the Game Boy Advance now has a partial English translation. Alongside Mobile Monsters Telefang Power Version, which some of you might recognize from the Power World video. This game is perhaps more well known for being the base game used in the Pokemon Diamond and Jade bootlegs, but you can now play the original version with a partial English translation. Bard's Tale for the NES was also translated. This is an interesting case because there was a US release, but a lot of the content was cut. This project took the original English script, ported it over to the Japanese version, and then translated everything that was missing, so you can now play the full original game in English. We also have translations for Shira and the Wanderer 4 Plus for the PSP, Samurai Showdown Tales of the Bushido for Neo Geo CD, and if you're an Advance Wars fan, you may know that there are many untranslated entries in the franchise, but Game Boy Wars is now playable in English. Then for mods and hacks, we have a few interesting entries. We got Mario Kart Double Dash Plus, which ports some familiar stages over, and then two new Super Mario Kart mods. Aim to be a Hero and Mario Kart SX both contain 20 new levels each. Then we also have Fire Emblem Accursed Fate, which is a fan-made sequel to Blazing Blade on the Game Boy Advance. Legend of Zelda Ancient Dungeon transforms the first game into a roguelike with randomized room generation. Star Fox EX has 17 new levels, new enemies, bosses, backgrounds, music, and more. Check out the full trailer in the description. And lastly, Kenton M, the developer of the Ocarina of Time Indigo mod, hosted an Ocarina of Time mod contest, which led to an impressive 17 entries. And if you want to watch videos of some of these Ocarina of Time mods, uh, two small channels that feature footage from it are Brady1 and Souls Midnight. And then in decompilation news, Legend of Dragoon has been fully reverse engineered, and in turn has received a port. So by supplying your PS1 ISO, you can now play it natively on PC with various enhancements. For Lost Media, there was an iNinja game planned for the Game Boy Advance, but it was cancelled. And the channel Hard for Games was able to dump and preserve a prototype of it. Far from perfect since it's unfinished, but the 3D effects on it are really impressive to see for the Game Boy Advance. We also uncovered an unreleased Hannah Montana prototype for the DS, which included the source code. It ended up being found on a hard drive at a recycling center. And on the topic of the Lost Media, let's talk about the Satellaview, which was a broadcast satellite peripheral for the Super Nintendo in Japan. Think of it like television broadcasts, but for video games. Given that the service has been discontinued, most of the 114 games featured are either partially lost or fully lost media. Uh, for example, BS Legend of Zelda only has a dump from the Week 3 broadcast, so it's considered mostly lost. Which brings us to BSF Zero, which to this day still has a $5,000 bounty on the Grand Prix 2 broadcasts. In 2018, VHS recordings of all the tracks made their way onto YouTube. And then from there, Guy Perfect used Graphite, a tool for calculating Super Mario Bros. positions and inputs. So by using Graphite, every track and input was eventually analyzed and recreated as closely as possible, so you can now play a fan recreation ROM hack of the BSF Zero tracks by patching it onto your copy of Zero, and the patch is region free, so it ran just fine on the BSNES emulator for me. The bounty still exists because this isn't the original, but this is probably the closest we're ever going to get to the real Satellaview backups. So next up, server shutdowns. The Wii U and 3DS eShops closed a while ago, but the rest of the online services will now officially shut down on April 8th, 2024. With a few exceptions such as Pokemon Bank and Poke Transfer. Which brings us to Team 0%, which aimed to clear every Super Mario Maker 1 level before the server shutdown. They were ultimately successful, but there was a bit of controversy behind it. In order to upload your stage to the Super Mario Maker servers, the creator has to clear the level themselves. That way on paper, you can't just upload an impossible to complete level. But the last level in question, Trimming the Herbs, was later found to have been cleared illegitimately using tool assistance, such as frame-by-frame -frame inputs and rewinding. So it's kind of like if you were trying to create a world record domino chain, and then you later find out that somebody super glued your very last domino to the ground. So the creator of Trimming the Herbs did come out and admit that he cleared the level illegitimately, meaning that Team 0% was successful in completing all of Super Mario Maker 1, but it was definitely a hollow victory to some. And you better believe that people are still going to try to beat the level anyways, especially since every single created stage for Super Mario Maker 1 has been properly archived. So I wish the best of luck of anyone bold enough to try. Next up, some emulator updates. Punez, which is one of the most accurate NES emulators out there, received a massive changelog, way too long for me to read. We also have an update for Ares, which is an underrated multi-system emulator, which has some of the best Nintendo 64 support around. And the biggest highlight of the Ares update is cheat support for multiple systems. But now we have a different kind of emulator update with Nintendo's lawsuit against Tropic Haze LLC, which owns both the Switch emulator Yuzu and the 3DS emulator Citra. Nintendo alleged that Tropic Haze LLC's developers and the Switch emulator Yuzu facilitates piracy and unlawfully circumvents technological measures, which led to the shutdown of both emulators. 
Citra is the way bigger deal here to me personally, but what does this lawsuit mean for your right to emulate as a whole? Nothing at the moment. This is a settlement, meaning that no official verdict was ever made by a judge, and therefore these shutdowns have no precedence towards emulation rights. In fact, having read the lawsuit myself, I would call this much less of an emulator lawsuit and much more of a business practices lawsuit. But to refresh everyone's memory on emulators in the US, Sony vs. Connectix was a commercial emulator that included a PS1 BIOS file, but that de minimis portion used was found to be fair use, and the judge even stated that some economic loss by Sony as a result of this competition does not compel a finding of no fair use. Sony understandably seeks control over the market for devices that play games Sony produces or licenses. The copyright law, however, does not confer such a monopoly, meaning that the Kinectix Virtual Game Station was a valid competitor to the PS1. Meanwhile, Sega vs. Accolade is one of the most important cases for reverse engineering as a whole. Accolade copied and then peeked at the Sega Genesis code for reverse engineering purposes to learn how the console security worked in order to make games without having to get licensed through Sega. So the Ninth Circuit held that because reverse engineering was the only means of gaining access to the unprotected aspects of the program, and because it was a legitimate interest in analyzing the aspects to find out how your cartridges would become compatible with the console, Accolade's initial copying for research and then the de minimis portion of code they used for compatibility, aka Sega's header files, were found to be fair use. So, commercial emulation is fine, in general, but it definitely puts a bigger target on your back. And while there's a respectable floor for emulation as a whole, it's far from perfect. Things start to get legally gray when you consider that these cases were before the DMCA went into full effect, which says that you can't circumvent a technological measure that effectively controls access to a protected work, and that includes the act of decryption. So in gamer terms, that means that you can't circumvent DRM like de novo or most modern console security. And the key phrase of ambiguity is primary purpose, meaning that nowadays even my retro game dumping devices and homebrew system retrieval tools technically falls into this gray area. So to remove all the legalese, you generally do have provisions to create personal use software backups, to reverse engineer, to format shift, etc., but you don't explicitly have the right to circumvent DRM, meaning we either need a formal legal revision or a precedent-setting court case to determine if certain acts are actually illegal. And while the DMCA does grant you permission to circumvent when necessary to achieve interoperability of an independently created program with other programs, the EFF has warned in the past about how vague and narrow these provisions can be, to the point where they don't always help the very people they were intended to assist. And this is why we now have situations where people have to genuinely ask if they can legally repair their own tractors. So Nintendo's favorite argument of stating that using their keys constitutes a prohibited circumvention is technically not wrong because this exact scenario has not yet been tested in a modern court. You have some semi-relevant cases, such as Lexmark International versus Static Control Components, that ruled that circumvention of ink cartridge authentication in order to use third-party cartridges did not violate the DMCA, but copyright by design in the United States is meant to be a case-by-case -case basis, and printer security is going to be different from console security. So this is all one fancy way to say that modern console emulation is one big it depends moment. At a purely personal and non-legal level, I think that the usage of the decryption keys in emulators as a whole might not be strong enough, because remember the dolphin key situation a while back was not an actual lawsuit. It was just a business dispute between Nintendo and Valve, and Valve reached out first. And the fact that Nintendo never formally pursued Dolphin, Simu, or any other emulator that uses such keys afterwards kind of tells me that Nintendo might be worried about the possibility of their argument being rendered useless if they go to court over it and then lose. Because piggybacking off what the Kinectix judge said, it's obviously in the best business interest of any console manufacturer to have no competitors, especially when such competitors sometimes run games better than on the original hardware, such as Deadly Premonition running on a PS3 emulator better than any official hardware, when these competitors can enable enhancements, homebrew, translations, and mods that might not necessarily be console compatible, and sometimes developers even sell their own games commercially as ROMs to reduce the distribution costs. I backed one on Kickstarter a while ago. So the optimal business strategy for a console manufacturer is you want to pick the easiest targets who make other egregious errors, and then try to fish around for a verdict specifically regarding circumvention in their favor so that they can one day pursue other emulators. And that finally brings us to the Citra and Yuzu situation, because again, having read everything, this is so much more focused on bad business practices by Tropic Haze. A reminder that in civil trials, it's not about guilty or not guilty, but rather you're going to be hearing terms such as liable, not liable, knew or should have reasonably known, etc. You do not have to commit a crime to be found liable. So at the surface level, things look okay. Tropic Haze's Discord has rules against piracy, 
Mentioning piracy in their servers will trigger a bot response followed by a hate mob, and they even have rules saying don't discuss games that break the street date. And some of Nintendo's arguments actually feel kind of weak. Blaming Yuzu for Tears of the Kingdom spoilers is something I don't agree with, because the best way to play a brand new Switch game is going to be on the Switch, which has built-in recording tools. And even acknowledging that some users probably pirate the prod keys isn't always necessarily a problem. I know that none of you actually backed up your PS1 BIOS back in the early days of emulation. Nowadays you just extract it from PS3 firmware, but that's besides the point. And there are even times when your code can be protected under your freedom of speech in the United States, but where things start to get more complicated is that the emulator developers provided instructions on how to dump your files, which becomes a bit more ambiguous over the circumvention dilemma. Other emulator developers do have such tutorials, but they also provide a huge disclaimer saying it's up to you to check the local laws in your jurisdiction first. And I could be wrong, but I don't recall Yuzu having such a disclaimer. And again, civil trial, it's a complex issue that probably would need a verdict. Side note, some people are screaming that this situation specifically is like trying to sue Microsoft because people use their OS for piracy sometimes. But Microsoft doesn't actively give you instructions on how to do so, so I think that this is a really bad analogy that needs to stop. But moving on to where things get more complicated, because of the key phrase primary purpose in the DMCA, Nintendo argues that because the official Switch backups don't work on Yuzu without their prod keys, it is a primary purpose of circumvention. Personally, I think this goes against the very spirit of the Connectix and Accolade rulings, but the interoperability argument in this scenario post-DMCA has not been tested, so it's still an it depends moment. There are some loopholes I know of, but I gotta stay on topic. Moving on, Zelda Tears of the Kingdom being playable was definitely a breaking point for Nintendo. However, to the best of my knowledge, the official versions of Yuzu could not run the leaked copy of Tears of the Kingdom prior to release. I personally don't know if the community-made fixes were entirely separate forks or just patches for the official build, but it's irrelevant either way, because in the realm of should have reasonably known, Nintendo alleges that Defendant and its agents were aware of these efforts too, and Bunny said as much in an interview with PC Gamer on the day of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom's release, explicitly referring to the gaming community releasing custom Yuzu builds to play Tears of the Kingdom ahead of its release. And I found that exact article, which can definitely be used against them. Additionally, Nintendo alleges that Yuzu has telemetry, and used this to determine that Tears of the Kingdom was one of the most played games in an interview. Did every single community fork or official version running patches disable their telemetry? If not, it can be argued that saying that them looking at trends, combined with the dramatic increase in Patreon subscriptions in correlation with the game leaking, means that they should have reasonably known that the trend started before the game's release. In addition to knowing that pretty much every instance reported was not going to be on a legitimate copy. Which then brings us to the most important issue, and that is the potential of testing on pirated games, aka not clean room reverse engineering and emulation. There is a photo floating around alleging that there was a ROM stash that the devs had, but as a personal rule of thumb, I never accept Discord screenshots as evidence because they can be easily faked. But I do remember the discussion of this stash coming up for many years before this lawsuit. And Nintendo states that Bunny leaked to a Patreon article, which on information and belief Bunny drafted, that announced on late May 28th, 2020, the day before Xenoblade Chronicles released, that the game was running in Yuzu, with a screenshot showing that date. What's the actual likelihood that every single developer who tested on it to get it ready used their own street date broken copy that they got from a retailer? And over the years they've had other various titles suspiciously playable on day one. But take this next part with a grain of salt because I haven't verified it, but I do remember people discussing various fixes for upcoming games being added to the early access branch and then sent to the main branch after the game's release. So overall, Nintendo's statement of on information and belief, plaintiff expects discovery to show that this data reveals to defendant and its developers that its users are playing pirated copies of games, really seems to all add up here. And that's the reason why I haven't mentioned Nintendo having deeper pockets this entire time, because it completely detracts from the actual key issue here, which is the importance of clean room reverse engineering and proper emulation development. Plenty of other emulator devs either bend over backwards to procure their games for testing, or they ask the community to help with testing and then reporting their results because they don't own the game. So if this case proceeded, Nintendo would have subpoenaed all communications, potentially discussing piracy among the developers, and additionally, it is very possible for information uncovered in a civil trial to eventually lead to formal criminal charges. And another important detail that keeps getting overlooked, we love to think that LLCs are just these magical shields that separate your personal assets from your company. But there is something known as tort participation theory, which can eliminate protections if members of that company actively participated. 
So if they went to court and it turned out that they did distribute pirated materials, them owning an LLC means nothing, and they also face jail time. So in other words, Tropic Haze LLC allegedly made multiple severe and continuous lapses in judgment and were completely fucked, so they had no choice but to settle. $2.4 million is a lot, but that cap is nowhere near the maximum possible damages that could have been milked out of them. And you definitely did not want Tropic Haze to be setting any sort of legal precedence in the modern DMCA, whether it's about your rights as a gamer or the rights to repair your own tractor. So moving on, the settlement also reads that, except for tools associated with developing Yuzu, which are to be destroyed, defendant and its members are also enjoined from allowing evidence to be destroyed, altered, or concealed by third parties. Uh, in other words, this is why their Discord hasn't been deleted yet. This is standard due diligence, but it can also mean that Nintendo will comb through it. Don't confess to your crimes on Discord. And the devs were also coerced into issuing an apology where they say that Yuzu facilitates piracy and circumvents technological measures. What this ultimately does is it makes it easier to take down forks in the future, because whoever files the takedown notice now gets to say, we think it's unlawful and even the devs agree with us. So long term, most of these forks might not matter because the code is effectively tainted. Moving on, by association, Citra was also taken down too, aka the only part of this story that I actually care about. Strong personal opinion here, but coming from the perspective of someone who lives in the United States who doesn't have to worry about availability or regional pricing, I don't give any fucks if my game is playable on an emulator day one. Enhancements and mods are nice, and I'm always going to get the most out of my games, but I get what I pay for with emulation. If I use a free alternative to official hardware, it works when it works. I only start caring about the compatibility by the time the original hardware and software are completely out of print, no matter how shitty or obscure it is. My 3DS no longer works, the console's no longer in print, and even if I buy a used 3DS, I can't re-download anything on the eShop since it's shut down. But fortunately, I don't have to worry about that last part because all of my downloads are archived and restorable. If I'm going to be sold nothing more than an admission ticket, I'm going to make sure I never lose that admission ticket. And of course, there's a lot more to the emulation discussion when you get into consoles and games that are decades old and never going to be re-released or localized, but none of that is relevant today because this is about developers who appear to have screwed up big time. So then to answer the question of, is Ryu Jinx next? It's going to depend on if they do things clean room and by the book. They've definitely been watched for years, but as long as they didn't screw up on the levels of Yuzu, they should be okay. Because Ryu Jinx wasn't making $40,000 a month off early access builds on Patreon, so there's a much smaller target on their back. More importantly though, as far as 3DS emulation goes, Panda 3DS and Mikage both exist, and those devs work very hard, but they're both newer emulators, and some titles will just never be playable. But one final emulator case to wrap this all up, Sony vs. Bleem, which both is and is not an emulator legal case. Sony did argue the use of the BIOS file, but that part never made it to court, and the judge granted a partial protection order. The technicality was that the promotional advertisements for Bleem itself contained copyright infringing images. It was found to be fair use in Bleem 1, but they eventually went bankrupt due to the legal costs. And years later, John Hangartner, the attorney who represented Bleem, gave a really good quote. Where you have ambiguity, it allows companies to bring lawsuits that are not quite a sham, but also not quite in good faith. Obviously, this doesn't apply to Yuzu as a whole, but this quote is how I feel about the personal use backup and key arguments specifically. And the EFF has a pretty good ongoing series about the many complications of the vagueness of the DMCA, which I'll link to, and they even mention emulation. Uh, the next hearing on revisions for circumvention exemptions is right around the corner, and we do have several speakers on schedule to discuss the issues with gaming DRM and emulation, but I'm sure that the main focus of this hearing is going to be all about AI. But let's move on to some uplifting gaming news, and that is Valve with their Steam Families feature. To simplify the big difference, uh, let's say that I'm playing Stardew Valley in my library. Even when I'm online, my brother can play nearly any other title in my library, such as Portal 2 from a different computer. So in other words, this policy has been updated to be the digital equivalent of physically letting someone borrow your games. So if my brother wanted to play Stardew Valley in my library because he didn't own a copy himself, he'd have to wait for me to finish playing first because I'm busy enjoying that new 1.6 update. Uh, there are a few other caveats to the policy, such as individual developers being able to opt out, there are limits to how often you can change families, and then you all have to be in the same region because there are regulatory nightmares otherwise. But all in all, this is a fantastic Steam update. Moving on to one more business story, this one from Canada. A man booked a flight with Air Canada and asked the chatbot about the bereavement rates. He trusted the words of the chatbot to apply for a rebate retroactively, but was later denied it by a human representative from Air Canada. 
He assumed for the difference because he relied on the information to his own detriment and had no reason to believe that the chatbot was providing inaccurate information, since Air Canada does have a bereavement policy. Air Canada admitted that the chatbot's words were misleading, but attempted to argue that the chatbot was a separate legal entity responsible for its own actions. And the court was having none of that. They said it's a part of the website, which Air Canada owns and is responsible for. Therefore, the plaintiff was entitled to the damages. Good call, because I don't want to imagine a world where people can say, you have to sue the robot instead, and then the robot gets to argue that it's not a human capable of sound judgment, and that you can't bind it to a contract because it's not a human. Sounds like a nightmare, so once again, good call. Back to gaming, I played the demo for Unicorn Overlord. I was kind of skeptical about this game when the trailer dropped, but I was completely wrong, and I am glad that I am wrong. Plays like a modern take on the Ogre Battle series, but with battle animations that feel like extended Fire Emblem turns. The demo is available on the PS4, PS5, Switch, and Xbox, and it's several hours long, which was more than enough to tell me that I liked it immediately. And even though I'm admittedly not entirely sold on the story yet, so far, it's on track to be one of the best SRPGs I've played in years. My next story was going to be my first impressions and experiences with the new Stardew Valley 1.6 update, but there are just so many new things added and improvements made that I would be here for another 20 or 30 minutes explaining everything. So yeah, great update. Concerned Ape completely undersold himself, as expected. So hang in there, console players. You'll get the update soon enough. And that's all I got for now. After I upload this video, I'm going to be doing some spring cleaning on my PC, and I'm just going to reinstall the operating systems, so I'll give you a sneak peek into that in the next episode. And I'll definitely talk about the lawsuits against Apple and the National Park Service. I'll also be working on a separate project for the game Banjo-Tooie, but don't expect that to be done anytime soon. And lastly, this constitutes an advertisement, so if you don't care, feel free to click off the video now, and I hope you have a wonderful day but I do have my first set of affiliate links for Humble Bundle and Fanatical. Both of these are digital game stores that I personally have been using for years. My only legitimate criticism is that Fanatical specifically, every now and then, does a mystery box thing. It's bullshit, stay away from it. But in terms of individual discounts and bundle pricing, both sites are great, and it's why I have over a thousand games in my Steam library. I've been informed that my commission rate is up to 5%, I'll find out real soon what up to actually means, but don't feel obligated to buy through me. If you're looking to buy a new game anyways though, this option now exists for supporting this channel. And that's all I got for now, I hope you all have a wonderful day.